the drivers and the engineers enter the January meetings focused. They don't daydream at all considering the fact that these were the people that excelled in the math classes. But if they were to doze off for a couple minutes, it would be about winning the Daytona 500, putting together an immaculate performance from start to finish to win NASCAR's biggest race of the year in front of the biggest television audience of the year for a motorsports event. Kyle Busch had that same dream and same expectation of winning the Daytona 500, especially considering how he performed in the 2008 running. However, dreams and expectations, they have a very dark flip side of disappointment and a boulevard full of broken dreams. Kyle Busch has led 32 of 34 laps so far. If you led the Daytona 500 at halfway, as Kyle Busch just did, in the last five years, you didn't go to victory lane. Boy, Brian Vickers, Dale Earnhardt Jr., that ain't oh, gonna work, on. boys. NRF Productions presents how Kyle Busch lost the 2009 Daytona 500. So wiping from memory how Kyle Busch's inexperience got the best of him on the final pit stop, his debut race, and debut Daytona 500 for Joe Gibbs Racing was kind of like Bubba Wallace at Kansas shushing out those haters. Kyle Busch had quite a bit of preseason critics after the fallout at Hendrick Motorsports, but in this event, he had a car that was so exceptionally good to where he arguably lost the Daytona 500 due to super speedway politics. This was such a testament to this new driver-crew-chief team combination that didn't even get to compete in the Bud shootout. And keep in mind, this was back in an era where it seems like almost anybody and everybody made the Bud shootout. I believe 2008 had somewhere north of 27 cars. Kyle Busch led 117 of the 362 laps run in a points-paying cup race at Daytona in 2008 getting the July 400 mile consolation prize by winning a statement six victory on the campaign. Man, Kyle Busch was so elite in the 2008 regular season and notice how I said 2008 regular season because Kyle Busch fans don't wanna talk about the 2008 chase, kind of like how Jeff Gordon fans don't wanna talk about the 2008 season as a whole. When the 2009 Daytona 500 rolled around, the favorites to win the Harley J. Earl Trophy rolled off the tongue like a Hall of Fame list. Dale Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Jeff Gordon, Mark Martin, Jimmy Johnson. These were the drivers that always found themselves leading the pack of 43 cars at Daytona or Talladega. And considering his performance at Super Speedway races in 2008, Kyle Busch was definitely on that list. Number one, to show that he's a good Super Speedway racer, and number two, to also foreshadow that he is a driver that is going to be a lock for the Hall of Fame. Okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. This is 2009 and Kyle Busch still doesn't exactly have the resume that would get him into the Hall of Fame. However, his driving in Speed Weeks would show just how much of a generational talent he is. On Saturday in the Bud Shootout, Kyle Busch led six laps and was up front for a majority of the race. On Thursday, in his qualifying race, Kyle Busch proved that he still loves beating that five. <laughs> Fun fact, he was just inches away from being approached by Rick Hendrick after the race and being told to hold his watch. Or, maybe based on conspiracies, Rick Hendrick is more of a hitman guy. Maybe. On Friday for Billy Ballou, Kyle Busch was exactly where he wanted to be with six laps to go in the race. In two of the last four Daytona truck races, there was a last lap pass for the win. Being in second, Kyle Busch was poised to strike. He envisioned in his head, we bowling when you bowl a strike. However, he would get 9 out of 10 pins, as he just couldn't topple Bodine in the final run to the finish. On Saturday for Joe Gibbs Racing, Kyle Busch had prepared his entire life to finally beat Tony Stewart in his marquee event, the Tony Stewart Daytona 300 Invitational. 
However, despite Kyle Busch being teammates with Tony Stewart and having a notebook full of things on how to tackle Daytona and other knowledge from Tony Stewart, he still couldn't beat the master as Tony Stewart continued the dynasty, which of course he's going to do in the Tony Stewart Daytona 300 Invitational. Speed Weeks now officially led into Christmas morning for the NASCAR industry members and fans alike. Despite stressing and worry from the suits and ties in Daytona, the 2009 running of the Great American Race would sell out overnight. The recession was kicking everyone's ass, but lower ticket prices and special ticket packages helped the 2009 Daytona 500 have the crowd that it deserved to have. Rolling off from the fourth position, this was the moment that Kyle Busch and Steve Addington were anticipating for the last three months. Maybe they weren't paying attention to every single detail in the meeting, but they were prepared as best they could. As three-time Daytona 500 winner Bobby Allison waited to greet the field, 43 drivers knew what they had gotten themselves into. This was going to be a grueling experience that would test them physically, mentally, and emotionally. But this sacrifice was all worth it for the slim chance that they were going to put their name on the Harley J. Earl Trophy after 200 laps, barring we don't get a random pop-up shower in the middle of the race. Bobby Allison waving a flag. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's go racing, boys. Martin Truex Jr. led the first lap of the brand new Earnhardt Ganassi Racing, which I want to break my silence for a second and say that Teresa Earnhardt should lead the hashtag demolish DEI movement because you look at what she's done in NASCAR, she could easily take on the woke, demonic, anti-male, anti-white agenda being pushed by all these companies. She would be the perfect embodiment to hashtag demolish DEI in the USA and the world for good. Meanwhile, Mark Martin led lap two, which led to this kumbaya moment between the doomer, realistic Mark Martin fans that knew pain, that's all they knew, and the optimistic, joyful Hendrick Motorsports fans that had just seen the last three Cup Series championships in NASCAR. You could not have more of an awkward meshing of the fan bases, but one thing was obvious. Mark Martin had the fan base, and in fact, he was in the top five in merchandise sales for Speed Weeks. That moment was quickly broken up after half a lap by guess who? KFB. 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 NASCAR's new black hat would silence the fans that weren't already silent considering that this was lap 3, an intimidating reminder that the Daytona 500 and professional auto racing can even take away from us the most intimidating people that, when they were on this planet, seemed almost unfazed by anything. As the caution came out for Eric Amarola spinning, Kyle Busch did not want to come down pit road despite having a vibration. In this Daytona 500, Kyle Busch valued his track position like a bodybuilder would value a meat-heavy, protein-rich meal. Now don't worry, we're going to find out later in this race as to why Kyle Busch had this mentality. Over the next two runs, crew chiefs were asking their drivers this one question. How can your car handle just as good as the 18? Because Kyle Busch would lead 50 consecutive laps, mostly unchallenged by his 42 competitors. At one point, it was the 18 leading all four Hendrick cars to where Rick Hendrick was probably asked this in his suite. Did Kyle Busch used to drive for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's doing quite well. Oh, yeah. At one point, he was also leading the 17, 6, and 9. So you've got Hendrick and Roush. So are we sure that these drivers weren't programmed to see Kyle Busch not as a teammate? Now, some NASCAR fans might see Kyle Busch lead all these laps and say, you see, that's just a testament to Kyle Busch's character. Can he let someone else lead a lap for once? Mike Joy in the Fox booth had a rebuttal to this thinking, saying, He's not greedy. He just wants to lead them all. Kyle Busch, at least in his younger years, loved to go out there and put on a show when the lights shine the brightest. Kyle Busch loved to eat W's like a guy in a pig shirt loved to eat out of a bowl like a pig on TikTok. Weird analogy to show how Kyle Busch loved to win races, but you could tell considering how Kyle Busch won 21 races one season ago. 
Eventually, Kyle Busch got to a point where he was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to sit back and let someone else lead this race. That being his childhood idol, Jeff Gordon, as he would lead the next 29 laps. Despite Jeff Gordon loving the clean air, and Jeff Gordon fans as well, considering that both of us alike, Jeff Gordon and us fans, were tormented heavily in 2008 by seeing Jimmy Johnson win all those races and Jeff Gordon get zero. This was a welcome sight to have the clean air, but you know what? The 18 team, they wanted the clean air a little bit more helping get the colorful number 18 M&M's Toyota out in front of Jeff Gordon's brand new number 24 Firestorm DuPont Chevrolet. Man, seeing those 2009 paint schemes, oh boy, they pull a lot of strings of nostalgia. By getting the track position back, Kyle Busch would lead lap 100 of the race, meaning that if this race were a 250 miler, that would be the win. By leading the halfway point, Kyle Busch was now a part of a troubling trend, kind of like the troubling trend of Buffalo Bills field goals going wide right in crucial moments. In the last five Daytona 500s, the leader of lap 100 did not win the race. Yes, Kyle Busch is now a part of this daunting statistic, but let's not act like anyone has actually been a real challenge to the 18. Jeff Gordon, one of the few to lead a lap in the Daytona 500 thanks to Mr. I like to lead them all, experienced a camber issue that forced him to make an unscheduled pit stop under green. Tire issues would become increasingly common, especially considering Daytona had a cheese grater of a surface back in 2009, which meant that the race's longest green flag run would be taxing the tires like the federal government likes to tax people's paychecks. Since when was the government working alongside me? Reid Sorensen, Elliot Sadler, Brian Vickers, Jimmy Johnson, and one Pablo Montoya, but not Kyle Busch, Steve Addington elected to keep him out there with the other leaders to retain track position, However, while there were many crew chiefs that didn't see the potential for disaster, Larry McReynolds watching from the booth definitely knew what was coming, considering he is the master of cheese grating after all. The Daytona surface would chew up and spit out the right rear tire of David Stremme. Under the yellow, Kyle Busch's pit crew dominated again, and I know Jeff Gordon as the Rainbow Warriors, Matt Kenseth as the Killer Bees, but Kyle Busch was definitely the candy crushers in this race. However, he would lose the lead as both Elliott Sadler and Reed Sorensen successfully remained on the lead lap after making their scheduled green flag pit stops. In addition, this was months before the double file restarts, shootout style era that was adored by Bill Weber. Okay, so bear with me as I try to explain this, but Brian Vickers and when Pablo Montoya were on the lead lap, however, they were not in front of Kyle Busch and the other leaders, leading the lead lap line full of lead lap cars even as they were scored somewhere in the late 20s, early 30s. I just don't understand how people can be so stupid. This meant that Kyle Busch, despite being third in the actual race, would restart fifth in line. NASCAR make this make sense, which ultimately they would later on in the season. Regardless, as the green flag waved, Kyle Busch and the 18 team were still in position to make their fantasies a reality by winning the 2009 Daytona 500. Rival Dale Earnhardt Jr., on the other hand, was having one of his roughest Daytona 500s. There was a lot of pressure entering the season for Dale Earnhardt Jr. to perform at such an elite level, considering that this is the second year of Jr. at Hendrick, which meant that it was a pivotal year, and rightfully so. There were no more excuses about, is the equipment up to an elite level? Of course it was. Jimmy Johnson has won the last three NASCAR championships in a row. Maybe that pressure was getting the most of him, maybe it was starting outside the top 10 in the Daytona 500 the first time, or maybe it was a wild story at the Silhouette Gentleman's Club. Did he drink too many Budweiser's? Did he bang too many hoes? I don't know, and we won't know, unless he goes on the Dale Jr. download and tells one of these stories if it actually happened. Because Dale Earnhardt Jr. in this race was just off. 
It is mind-boggling to see Dale Earnhardt Jr. in this race considering he had one of the few cars that could actually challenge the 18. He ignored the preaching and strong words of wisdom from Larry McReynolds as in the Daytona 500, you absolutely do not beat yourself, especially on pit road. During one of the pit stops, you could mistake Dale Earnhardt Jr. for one of the three blind mice considering how he just casually missed his pit sign. Now, forced to restart in the 35th position, Dale Jr. would aggressively charge through the field knowing the rain could cut this 500 short at any moment. As described by the Fox booth, Jr. is making the kind of moves that you expect to see from an Earnhardt in the last 10 laps of the race, not with 10 laps to halfway. Just as Earnhardt was riding the high banks of the Daytona racetrack like a surfer was riding the high waves on Daytona Beach, things came crashing back down. Dale Earnhardt Jr. made his pit stop with the right front tire on the line. That was considered at the time an illegal stop in NASCAR, which is insane because even as you had the NASCAR official over here trying to clarify to the team, this is a penalty, you need to back up, the tire changer was like, come on man, get out of my way. I don't know, the only way that I can explain this is if the guy had a time machine and picked up an iPhone from 2024 that had Get Out of My Way by Tadashi on it and was jamming out to that while he was pushing this guy aside because it was mind boggling for sure. So let's set the picture, there's rain in the area, there's a strong sense of urgency and you have a driver like Dale Earnhardt Jr. who's now as red as the red 88 on his side door. He is going to race with a lot of passion and emotion to try to get his lap back. So with all of these circumstances into play, this would lead to some chaos to where Larry Mack would say, all of this uncalled for with 75 laps left in the race. Boy, Brian Vickers, Dale Earnhardt Jr., that ain't gonna oh, work, boys. Vickers hard. Here we Kyle go. Kyle Busch, the dominant car of the day, in the wall. That was wrong. And That's 10 wrong. cars sliding, slamming into the infield. This was the big one of the Daytona 500 that broke so many drivers and teams, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. However, there was no car and no driver that was as damaged as Kyle Busch after this crash. His car that was once unchallenged in the draft was now to the point where it could not be repaired to at least run competitively. For Kyle Busch, his chance to win the 2009 Daytona 500 was over. I'm sure if Hark Carlson were somewhere out there watching this race, he probably would have commentated this race something like this. Oh, what are you doing? You gotta be beeping me. What in the hell are you doing? I'll tell you what. They have got to start making guys be accountable. That is totally absurd. I'm sure Kyle Busch internalized maybe saying something like this in his head, but for the most part, the 24-year-old was professional coming out here and saying that simply they made their bad day our bad day. Now, Dale Earnhardt Jr. would share his side of the story, and his painted the picture that he didn't mean to wreck the 18. Go! Yeah, it was accidental. I went on to wreck the field. He drove me down into the, almost into the grass. I was just trying to get back up on the racetrack. Now, I've got to break my silence, and Junior Nation isn't going to like this one bit, but Dale Earnhardt Jr. in this situation was an absolute piece of shaving cream. Be nice and clean to reference a song that absolutely no one in Gen Z or the millennial generation is going to get the reference of. At the end of the day, this Daytona 500 loss teaches a rather depressing lesson that sometimes life is completely out of your control. Kyle Busch, Steve Addington, and the number 18 team did everything right. Maybe they didn't listen in full to the January meetings, but they were applying their daydream of dominating and winning the Daytona 500 to almost absolute perfection. Thanks to Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s aggressive move, which maybe wasn't his fault. Possibly, Rick Hendrick took inspiration from Larry Dennett Jr. and Talladega Knights and instructed him to take him out. Probably not, but either way, one thing was consistent. 
As Kyle Busch walked the exit tunnel to leave Daytona, this would be his most heartbreaking walk along the boulevard of broken dreams, reminiscing on a lost chance at winning the Daytona 500. If you enjoyed this video, NRF Productions has no shortage of full tank Daytona 500 content for you to binge watch as the Great American Race looms just around the corner. Other than that, this is Nathan for Digital Gas House, Life's a Beach, and then you drive.